I used to read this book which my dad had quite a lot. I guess that influenced me quite a bit and in my early 20s I began my research into our mysterious past. I didn't have access to rare texts or secret libraries. I used to depend on online sources like Bill Cooper's Mystery Babylon, Cedric Leonard's website Atlantis Quest. But more than all that, I used to maintain my own research project of comparative mythology, not overlooking any source, Mesopotamian mythology, Norse, Egyptian, Tolkien ultimately. And ultimately, back in 2015 or so, I realized that the origins of the sounds of the alphabets, the word roots which are shared across different cultures and societies but originate from a common past, the origins of these word roots were very ancient. I used to think back then that it all originated from what some call Proto-Indo-European culture. But that was more like a misleading idea which I picked up from unreliable mainstream scholars. I slowly realized that the society from which these roots originated was not limited to ancient India or ancient Europe and not even the earth. But this society was spread across the galaxy and it was spread across a very long timeline. So it was not a society, it wasn't united, it had a lot of factions and it had a lot of war. Back then I used to think that these alphabets and the numbers which correspond to them represented some powers. But they actually represented stages of society, different ages, which might indeed be associated with certain types of powers, but it's more accurate to look at it as ages more than factions or leaders of factions. And all these alphabets and numbers, they're all associated with a measure of meaning. For example, the name of any person can be seen as having some cumulative meaning, defined by the letters that occur in the name and the order of the letters. Not just names of people, but for example, the names of machines, the names of projects, and the meanings of code. For no name is accidental. And all this information is what I reveal in this documentary series about the letters, the numbers, the colors and the shapes too. All this information that I found through more than a decade of research in my 20s and early 30s. And all this is qualitative information. You can call it capstone or keystone information. Which means it's a small amount of powerful information which can help you understand everything else. A huge quantity of information. So you can afford to not waste your time with the kind of details which can be figured out if you know the keystone information, but the keystone information itself is something that you really should know. It can help you see the meaning in what otherwise seems to have none. By now I understand very well the origins of the alphabets and the numbers which reflect in for example the jersey numbers won by sportsmen. And this film is all about that the history of how all these things played out their parts in the galaxy. And on understanding all this, you can understand all the meanings of all the names and the places and the foods and anything else. And for example, what this scene from The Matrix was trying to talk about. This is the kind of information which leaders of organizations usually have. So if you want to lead your own life, you definitely want to know these things. And now you can lead your own life without having to rely on unreliable data given by the parasite powers. As a general rule that data tends to be carefully falsified, designed to mislead people into traps. Because there's a very typical kind of linear minded person who can be defined as a data parasite and that's something you should know. Luckily, I found all this keystone information on my own rather than being handed down this data in a secret society. And this implies, firstly, that I haven't sworn an oath of secrecy, so I can reveal it all to you. And secondly, the information is more reliable because it's not been handed down, it's all been derived from first principles. So now finally you don't have to depend on unreliable sources of information. Aha, here he is at last. Neo is the one himself. 
right? And the legendary Morpheus. And Trinity, of course, si belle qu'elle me fait souffrir. I have heard so much of you honor me. Please sit, join us. This is my wife, Persephone. Something to eat? Drink? No, thank you. Yes, of course. Who has time? Who has time? But then if we do not ever take time, how can we ever have time? Chateau Aubryon, 1959. Magnificent wine. I love French wine. Like I love the French language. I have sampled every language. French is my favorite. Fantastic language. Especially to curse with. Nom de Dieu, de putain de bordel, de merde, de saloperie, de connard, d'enculé de ta mère. You see, Wiping your ass with silk. I love it. You know why we are here. Mm. I am a trafficker of information. I know everything I can. The question is, do you know why you are here? We are looking for the keymaker. Oh, yes, it is true. The keymaker, of course. But this is not a reason, this is not a why. The keymaker himself, his very nature is a means, it is not an end. And so, to look for him is to be looking for a means to do what? You know the answer to that question. But do you? You think you do, but you do not. You are here because you were sent here. You were told to come here and then you obeyed. <laughs> It is, of course, the way of all things. You see, there is only one constant, one universal. It is the only real truth, causality. Action, reaction, cause and effect. Everything begins with choice. No, wrong. Choice is an illusion created between those with power and those without.
Long before the birth of light, there was darkness. And from that darkness came the Dark Elves. Millennia ago, the most ruthless of their kind, Malekith, sought to transform our universe back into one of eternal night. Such evil was possible through the power of the Aether, an ancient force of infinite destruction. Malekith. To understand the earliest times and what happened in the matter and the primordial soup of similar pieces of matter which had similar amounts of energy, we have to understand a bit about energy flow across matter. We have to understand a bit about entropy which can be described in the context of energy as the tendency of energy to flow from the more energetic matter to the less energetic matter. Well, an example of that can be like how if you have a long metal rod and you heat up one end, the heat will flow to the cooler end. So energy always flows from the place which has more energy to the place which has less energy. It has a tendency to distribute itself. Now let's understand electrical energy. Now imagine an atom which is the tiniest part of matter. So you can look at this atom as a man. In his hand is a shaking energetic piece of jelly. Now this can be called an electron. It's like the highly energetic part of the atom. Now this piece of jelly, it's not very stably situated on the hand. It might try to jump. Especially if you put another piece of jelly in the same hand, then there's excess energy in this atom. And now we can say that this atom is negatively charged. It's got excess energy, which will try to jump to another atom nearby. So science will say that this atom has a negative charge, represented by a minus sign. And a deficiency of energy when a guy has no jelly in his hand, that's called a positive charge. So obviously if one guy has two jellies in his hand and they're shaking and they bang into each other and the jelly like it bangs so hard into each other that it jumps into the nearby empty hand. This is how electric current flows. Well, scientists talk about photoelectric effect, how light in the form of particles called photons are thrown upon some matter. This causes the excitation of the electron and this causes the matter to pop out an electron. Again, this is like a misleading thing. Light is not like photons or anything, it's simply the transfer of energy and we'll see exactly how that happens. And then they talk about X-rays. They say that if you throw current upon this particular kind of matter, this causes the emission of light. The photons march out. But it's like really misleading to say all these things because these phenomena are simply an exchange of energy from one small piece of matter to the other and that's the propagation of energy. There's no traveling photon, there's no traveling electron associated with some kind of velocity. In fact, these are instantaneous processes because as soon as one jelly jumps into the neighboring hand, then that hand's jelly jumps into the neighboring hand and this happens like instantaneously all the jellies jump into the neighboring hand. So there's no velocity, you see, there's no photon traveling down this road. Light or current is exactly the same thing. It's the instantaneous transfer of energy from the place which has more energy to the place which has less energy. It's just like a reservoir of water. The water level is like absolutely the same across the body of water. If you add some water at this point A, it's exactly at the same time that water will rise in the opposite end at B. 
and this is how even the slightest excess energy escapes as far as it can. So this is just how light travels, it's instantaneous. This is how current travels, it will get jumpy and it will just jump into the neighboring hand. The neighboring hand's electron will simultaneously jump into the neighboring hand. It's an instantaneous process. There's no velocity of light. There's no velocity of current. So light and current are both similar. Light is a transfer of energy which is diffused across all directions unless it's blocked. But electric current as you know it like in wires it's along one direction. Although in lightning even the current can like jump here and there a bit like light. And conversely, in a laser, the light will just travel in one direction, like in an optic fiber. So they talk about how in the ancient past, the speed of light used to be much more than what it's now, misleading. And that's why scientists used to talk about the luminiferous ether, which means light-bearing ether. It was a postulated medium for the propagation of light before the current dark ages began and they started talking about photons and a speed of light. Light is just an energizing of what you see as air, but it's more accurate to see it as a substance ether. At least it's not a vacuum. Uh, if you have enough energy, this light will go far. If you have like just a bit of energy, this light won't go far. It will just die out like how a torch light does not go much farther than a few meters. The idea that when you look at the edge of the galaxy you see like the history which was like a billion years back in the past is absurd. If a light is shown in the edge of the galaxy and if enough energy is like put into that then you'll see that like instantly as a strong lag time. As seen in the instantaneous internet calling, data is not taking time to travel. Uh, if you look at latency or lag in long range multiplayer games, that's not caused by the data marching across like a long distance, it's due to something else like reduced transmission efficiency, which is indeed proportional to the distance, but it's not because of velocity of current. And the earliest forms of matter we can see as neutrons and protons and electrons. Electrons, the jelly in the hand, the highly energetic particles which are much smaller and neutrons and protons are much heavier. Neutrons have no charge and protons have positive charge which means they always keep the electrons nearby. You can see it as the hand which holds the electron. So, protons and neutrons being much heavier, these are called baryonic particles. As for the particles which are heavier than this, well, those are the atoms which are formed of neutrons and protons and electrons. And different atoms combine themselves and all these combinations of neutrons and protons into atoms and of different atoms into different combinations of molecules, everything is guided by entropy. These are conducive to the ambitions of energy to distribute themselves. That's why these come together in this way. That's why these molecules are created. There is no involvement of a creator. Matter configures itself to serve entropy better. The formation of these forms is, is just the path of least resistance taken by entropy.
What we need to do is have a look at some lone pairs of electrons here on the oxygen atom of the OH group. In benzene, there's a delocalized ring system. This pi system above and below the plane of the carbon atoms is spread out and the density of the electrons is not very high. Now in phenol, one of these lone pairs of electrons actually forms part of this pi system. So here's the pi system, and then it starts to incorporate a lone pair of electrons in here. What that does is it increases the density of electrons in that pi system. Now there's another really important thing that this impacts upon. Now because the lone pair here is drawn in towards the ring and delocalizes and becomes part of the ring system, the effect is the oxygen is also drawing electrons towards itself because it's more electronegative than the hydrogen. The impact that has is it weakens this bond here between the oxygen and the hydrogen. And that makes phenol ever so slightly acidic. Now it's a weak acid because it only partially dissociates Scientists usually think of entropy as something that pushes matter apart into simpler forms but that's not necessarily true because there's also entropy in the context of energy. So more complex forms of matter can arise if the eventual end of the distribution of energy is achieved by such a complex formation of matter. To understand how simple organic life forms could root energy this way or send electrons across we can look at the pyring of phenol. So there's this tendency for the hydroxyl OH- to donate its energy in the form of an electron into the benzene pi system. And this is especially true if the hydroxyl itself is energized. Now what I want you to imagine is if you combine this part, this phenol, with something called an amine. Now this amine is known for a tendency to send the electron away into the other direction. So this creates a sort of bridge structure. So if there is an extra electron in the OH- the hydroxyl end, it can force the native hydroxyl electron to jump into the pi ring, from where it can be picked up by the amine, whose own native electron will be pushed outward into the other direction. So these were some of the earliest molecules of life energy forwarding organs, the well-known so-called neurotransmitters. Mainstream neuroscience has not exactly understood how they work. Now science knows that information is transmitted from one neuron to the other. In the first decades of the 20th century, there used to be a substantial debate on whether the transmission between neurons was chemical or electrical, but chemical synaptic transmission was seen as the only answer. So the recent discovery of electrical communication was surprising. Chemical transmission has a short delay, but electrical transmission across so-called gap junctions is almost instantaneous. And there is a pretty widespread idea that dopamine or norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter which relays chemical information. So it was believed that information is transmitted across neurons by dopamine or norepinephrine when they go physically across the synapse from one neuron to the other. But it was recently found that norepinephrine is also present in gap junctions where they work for electrical transmission across two neurons. And dopamine in having a similar structure is possibly found in gap junctions as well. Although gap junctions may be more classically or even exclusively associated more with norepinephrine than dopamine, which seems to be more typically associated with chemical transmission. Anyway, the mechanism in chemical transmission is probably very similar to that of electrical transmission since dopamine or norepinephrine is being used in chemical transmission as well and the transmission mechanism, the trigger conditions which we'll just study in a while are possibly the same for both chemical and electrical transmission. Since chemical transmission 
and electrical transmission both use the same neurotransmitters which are the heart of the mechanism of transmission as we'll just study in a while. So if you consider a person's brain, this person knows some things better than others which feature less in his thought process. So there's this concept of plasticity which means the formation of electrical transmission across neuron synapses and norepinephrine goes and sits at the heart of the gap junction and dopamine possibly has a similar role. And that's why recent data was found about how these neurotransmitters also play a role in the regulation of neurogenesis, which means the formation of new neuronal pathways. And an example of that is the making of a gap junction where there's heavy activity. So, if norepinephrine or dopamine sits very well in a synapse between two neurons, there is the formation of a gap junction over there and transmission over there is instantaneous. So you'll have really quick decision making with the data represented by those pathways. So it seems that dopamine or norepinephrine is released as some kind of tracer to help thinking across a synapse when a new habit is considered or a new idea is thought when you think for the first time that two pieces of data are interrelated. But if this new pathway is fated to become a solid part of your worldview, then dopamine or norepinephrine becomes part of a gap junction which forms across that synapse across which electrons jump in instantaneous communication a solid worldview a low noise situation where decision making is quick and you're sure about what you know that is the ideal or steady state of the brain if you settle into a niche and you can actually do things over there, he's got some methods which work. This is true mental maturity but it's not prioritized in many typical massive data handling situations which people have, like say the typical employment to retirement cycles where quantity of data is pretty high and quality of data is not so much. It's a high noise situation. Machiavellian social politics, for example, where the guy is just like some AI or say some big data processor processing a lot of data. So in the problematic situation, there is no guiding worldview. There are fewer gap junctions and the person will be almost amorphous. He will become whatever the situation demands him to be. 
which will keep him on top for some time like he might become a successful politician but at what cost he will get alzheimer's disease there have to be like a bit more gap junctions because that's what helps in quick decision making now if you look at dopamine or norepinephrine there's two in case of dopamine or three in case of norepinephrine hydroxyl ends for the last six or seven years i've had this theory about how these two neurotransmitters work and now it's time to upgrade it now that we understand their roles as molecular bridges in gap junctions or even the chemical transmission is something like a simulation of a gap junction where it still behaves as a molecular bridge a relatively straightforward realization is that there's a systemic threshold for the bridging process what i mean is that the dopamine molecular bridge will only be triggered if both the hydroxyls receive electrons in dopamine's case or in norepinephrine's case if all three of the hydroxyls receive electrons so there's this term tripartite synapse first introduced in the 1990s to account for a growing body of evidence that something called glial cells which were thought to be passive support cells initially actually play an active role in signaling the integration of synaptic information so the dopamine system is a tripartite synapse two ends the upstream neuron with the incoming signal and the glial cell carry two electrons which are donated to the two hydroxyls in the dopamine molecule and these two hydroxyls donate these two electrons into the pi system from the pi system the amine takes up the electron and pushes it down the third player in the tripartite synapse the other neuron downstream of the signal and this only works if both the hydroxyls donate electrons to the pi system so that it becomes very rich in electrons it doesn't work if only one hydroxyl donates an electron to the pi system the threshold is not triggered so there's no signal which goes downstream of the tripartite junction but then recently more observations were made which suggested that something called an ECM or extracellular matrix can be a fourth element of something called a tetrapartite synapse so these have four players four tendrils which are coming into this junction so this tetrapartite synapse must be associated with norepinephrine just because norepinephrine needs three of its hydroxyls to be energized to push the electron down the amine when all three hydroxyls enrich the pi system that's when the threshold is met and the amine pushes an electron into the downstream synapse so the dopamine system is a tripartite synapse one of the implications of all this is that dopamine is associated with a lower level associative thinking and by that i mean it integrates only two signals Norepinephrine has one extra dimension of complexity. It integrates signals from three pathways. Only if all three are present will it fire down from the output. An example of broad-mindedness or norepinephrine-based thinking, which is like true thinking, non-linear thinking, would be like solving mysteries and being more objectively logical, solving problems which are the common problems which defy entropy and so on. We can safely assume that these molecular systems send just one electron down the bridge. What's interesting to note is that after the signal has been sent down this molecular bridge, the pi system still has one electron left. Or in case of norepinephrine, there are two electrons left in the pi system. And these extra electrons are obviously removed from the mechanism. to prepare it for the next transmission the next work cycle now the question is where does the extra energy go remember there's more energy available after work in case of norepinephrine double the amount of energy as compared to dopamine one clue based on how dopamine handles the more political or linear data processing is that in some very strived on parts of the world like Congo the site of the deadliest conflict since World War 2 with 5 million deaths or Texas 
or more generally the Tex-Mex area that connects the worlds of the living and the so-called dead, about whom we'll study more later. This area has its very spine broken by the idea of the undead wall, for example. And a third example would be the Catatumbo River Basin, just a bit south of the Tex-Mex area, a place ravaged by undead gangs of drug and human smugglers, which is also known for a population more susceptible to early onset Alzheimer's disease. As we can clearly see, linear mentality dominates local politics in such places. In all such places, we can see that the ground where the people live is constantly struck by lightning. It is absolutely not a coincidence. What's going on over here is that lightning is the universe's way of recharging the local atmospheric bank of energy by donating electrons into the general area. So when large groups carry out too much dopaminergic, linear thinking in all these places, they strip the near-ground atmosphere of energy just how a swarm of locusts might strip the land of vegetation, creating a local deficiency of charge and that's where lightning strikes. And exactly the opposite can be seen in non-linear thinking. There's this typical kind of test called the oddball paradigm which involves a type of thinking which is very obviously related to non-linear thinking and norepinephrine. And researchers find that an electric signal emerges from the brain, something called a P300, when the act of non-linear thinking is carried out, when norepinephrine is being used. Now Neuwenhuis has pointed out that norepinephrine is involved in decision making. And when the decision is made from a lot of signals, all the signals, which is a high amount of energy, collapses into the output, a low amount of energy, and that represents a high quality information. This kind of processing of a large amount of information to arrive at a few decisions or for example the solution to a mystery using a lot of clues, this is the way of the norepinephrine oriented brain, what's called the low noise brain. So when the high amount of signals collapses into a low amount of signals, all the extra energy left over after the work is done by the norepinephrine work cycles after the decision has been made seems to simply escape out of the brain. So this kind of person, the nonlinear thinker, can also be seen as an energy source since the energy keeps escaping out of his or her brain. Not so much energy is required to do the right things. Well, if you struggle against entropy's will, you require all the energy in the world, but you still won't achieve your ends. And how does dopamine overuse suck up energy from the surroundings? The design of the healthy or normal brain expects a certain amount of norepinephrine activity. It expects a certain amount of charge to be freed up by mental activity. So because the process which over relies on dopamine is very hungry for energy, 
there is a very low availability of useful energy in the form of electrons in the brain. There is a high acidity. And indeed, John Wemmy has linked increased acidity in the brain to panic disorders, anxiety, depression, and the typical kind of diseases which are very easy to associate with dopamine overuse and norepinephrine underuse. And even cancer cells are characterized by higher acidity. And if you look at the opposite kind of person, the more norepinephrine oriented person, why does energy leave his or her brain? That's just because electrons by nature don't stack up well. Energy has a tendency to distribute itself. That's why it escapes out of this kind of a brain. So this kind of a person doesn't need to meditate, is inherently meditative. The more dopamine oriented person in contrast is lost, doesn't have the means to tell high quality data from low quality data. For example, a bully as a kid has a lifestyle of handling a lot of low quality data. That's why he might end up bullying instead of living his life the right way. So this phenomena of energy parasitism is what invented history. Entropy wants energy to be distributed and if some organisms take up too much energy from the surroundings from the common bank of energy for too little pro-entropic activity, that's not something which entropy is going to like. So it's entropy which turns energy sources against energy sinks. Just because energy has a tendency to balance itself out across space and matter, whatever be the other subjective ideas that dictators might have, a lightning cloud striking down an energy sink, these are the kind of activities which define the dynamics of society. And these are the things which define history, the direction which history will take. And this also causes evolution. This defines the nature of evolution. When Eddington called entropy the arrow of time, it reflects the reality of how time is always catching up with energy sinks, which happens through the evolution of energy sources. More norepinephrine based energy source life forms evolve to take on the more simplistic dopamine based energy sink life forms. Now that we've understood the meaning of history, let's get back to the history of the earliest times. <laughs>